Hello everybody. So today we're going to be talking about prescribed fire. Um, this picture right here uh, is from uh, the case study that we'll talk about um, at the end of the lecture. This is uh, from the Shaver Lake area on Southern California Edison lands where uh, I participated in a prescribed burn with a few people and um, it was one of the areas that was a uh, true uh, kind of success story um, for uh, during the uh, creek fire. Um, where, you know, a lot of that Shaver Lake area burned up, but this land was just fine. So let's start off with what is a prescribed burn. So the definition of a prescribed burn is any fire ignited under predetermined conditions to meet management objectives. And the key part, uh, or the two key parts there, is that the fire is ignited under predetermined conditions. So we you, you say this is the the perfect weather or really not so much the perfect weather but the acceptable weather conditions where we can put fire on the ground and we can keep control of it as best we can and then the other part of it is to meet management objectives so you don't want to just burn land to just burn land what is it we're actually trying to accomplish what are we doing are we getting rid of fuels are we um, um increase increasing our um bettering wildlife habitat are we um, trying to uh, restore habitat what are we what are we doing there's got to be some sort of a, a management objective so it's a fire un ignited under predetermined conditions to meet management objectives and we'll talk about all of that in more detail so um, the big thing here in California is that we're trying to restore fire on the landscape. Um, this, this, it's a huge deal. Uh, and if you want to pause the video right now and click on this link to uh, an article from the Sierra Club, you can pause. But what we're trying, what we're talking about here in terms of restoring fire on the landscape is that California, and we talked about it throughout the whole class so far is a extremely fire prone landscape and it's got fire dependent species and it's got um, fire um, um, species that are um, that love fire and do well with fire and so what we need to do is bring that fire back onto the landscape now there's two ways that we can do that right now. We're stuck in this idea of, well, we're just at, we're going to try and resist fire and end up with a bunch of um, really, really big fires. Or what we can do is we can control what fire gets put on the landscape. We can have smaller, much more manageable fires and um, and be able to actually still put fire into the landscape while also not putting so much at risk and then getting to some sort of a more acceptable normal fire interval like we've talked about before in the past where it says oh well this area burns every 10 years well that's fine it doesn't have to burn every 10 years where everything burns down it just needed you know a small understory burn and that's something we could do with prescribed burning if we can get the landscape back um into into um into enough of a reduced fuel load where that's possible. So right here, this is just kind of an example um, from, uh, I think I picked this up when I was down in Florida, but just the idea of um, why, why fire works and why um, prescribed fire works. So we have these pictures here, we got the burn happening. You can see these smaller trees. You can see immediately after the prescribed fire, we didn't burn, we burned some stuff, you know, it's, things are brown, but it's fine. When you look at it, you know, two weeks after the fire, there's a bunch of stuff already growing. The trees are fine. No big deal. It's okay to use fire, right? Trees are fire resistant. They're not fireproof. You can definitely burn the trees down, but if you know what you're doing, you'll be all right. Like um, this example here is from Longleaf Pine. If you know about longleaf pine, you know that they have these big white buds that they call candles. And as long as you don't burn the candles, tree's fine. So I just have to make sure that the trees I want to live, I don't burn the candles. So like, let's say I'm burning in a bunch of saplings, right? Which is this stage right here. I know right there 
that's my main leader. I definitely don't want to burn that. And if I can, I don't want to burn the candle here or the candle here. So I'm only going to put, you know, if this is 10 feet tall, I'm only going to put, you know, a fire where I can get two foot flame lengths. And, they, and if you say to yourself, well, how do you know that? Well, then that's where that pre um, predetermined conditions come in. I have to know my temperature, my wind speed, my humidity. Um, you know, I have to understand uh, what what my mixture in the drip torch is going to be and I've got to do I've got to have all of these kind of ideas going so that I know that if I'm going to try and burn this I can make the fire only be this tall as opposed to it being roaring whereas if I'm trying to burn a mature long leaf fire I'm going to need a little bit more of a flame length and a little more fire um it's it's let's see how do I want to phrase it prescribed fire doesn't have to be exact you have to know what you're doing you have to be able to really um, understand the ecosystem understand how the fire is going to burn understand your weather conditions you have to you have to have a lot of different understandings but you also it doesn't have to be perfect if i say i'm really hoping for like two foot flame links and you got three foot flame links or you got foot flame links it's okay it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't have to be that exact. But if I say I want, you know, I want to get about like two foot flame lengths, get my, like a nice slow burning fire. And all of a sudden I've got like 10 foot flame lengths and the thing is moving faster than I can keep up with it. That's problematic. And so that's the difference. Yes, it doesn't have to be exact, but you still have to have a pretty good idea of what you're going to do. So there's another... Um, part to um, prescribe fire that doesn't involve us actually doing the the burning and that's uh, called wildland fire use um, there's some other terminology um, that that's used to mean the the same thing and um, but basically it's a naturally ignited fire that's then um, allowed to burn because it's not in a position where it's going to affect um, affect uh, humans and it can accomplish resource objectives. So our definition of wildland fire use is a prescribed naturally ignited fire that will be allowed to burn so long as it is accomplishing resource objectives. And the reason we can put that word prescribed in front is because, um, you know, if you're managing something, um, and this right here is from uh, Yosemite National Park. So if I'm managing Yosemite National Park, I've already um, looked at a map and set up boundaries and areas where I say in this area because we don't have a campground or campers or anything like that if we get a start we're gonna let this burn and we're just gonna we're gonna manage it and let it burn because it can accomplish resource objectives and it can kind of it can help the park keep with its natural um, natural um, fire um, natural fire regime and so there's there's times where they will just let fires burn and you can see this fire right here i mean it was july 31st 2017 it was 1500 acres caused by lightning up at 7300 feet so um they know exactly where it is they're not going to just let it burn to where it can be problematic for for people or for the for the park it's just if 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 it's burning in an area they know they can keep it under control very easily and it's accomplishing resource objectives then they let it go because you know the we know that the that certain areas of california just actually need to have fire they need to burn it's great for the ecosystem and this is just another way to let that happen uh, if you want you can pause and you can either listen to or read uh, this article um, about wildland fire use from the uh, kaibab national forest So reasons for burning. Um, I got two links here. You can click on them. Uh, this one's an article from The Guardian. And then this one down here is a YouTube video on cultural burning, which I think is, is really great. Um, but go ahead and pause and check those out. But in terms of reasons for burning, there's a lot of different things. Um, and I'm sure there's even more than what's on this list, but these are kind of uh, main ideas that you'll um, 
that you'll see for the most part in terms of when you're when you're burning. Uh, you're burning to reduce fuels. You're burning for aesthetics, so to um, enhance the habitat. You're uh, you could, might be burning for stand regeneration. So either maybe you have too many trees and you're trying to open it up so that the trees that are already established can get bigger, or you're trying to um, just burn out a few trees so that you you know kind of the um, your you can promote certain trees to to start kind of um, accelerating in their growth. Uh, you can enhance wildlife habitat. You can improve range for livestock, uh, especially in uh, in California right now. There's a lot of areas uh, in terms of rangelands where the the non-native invasive plants actually do not do well with fire. So if we could reintroduce fire on a consistent basis to the um, to these rangelands, we get rid of a lot of the the non-native species. You can uh, use it to stabilize watersheds. And the idea of um, using fire to then promote growth, and if we can get a lot of growth, get a lot of roots within the soil, that would um, help stabilize the watershed and prevent erosion from happening. You can use it for restoration to a proper um, to a proper role in ecosystem, which we talked about. That's the idea of returning it to its natural fire regime. Uh, you could um, be burning for cultural significance, which hopefully you watch that video and you can um, see what we mean in terms of cultural burning. You can uh, burn for an improvement of the forest or the rangeland. And um, what seems to be the, the big issue right now in California is reducing the risk of catastrophic fire by actually having fire in the ecosystem that is under our control. So what do you need in a burn prescription then? Because we talked about this idea that you're going to do it under predetermined conditions. So how do you, what is what goes into the plan if we're going to burn with predetermined conditions? So we want to have objectives, which usually relates to something on that list that I just talked about uh, in terms of, you know, are we improving rangeland habitat? Are we um, trying to improve wildlife habitat? Are we reducing risk of catastrophic fire? What is it we're trying to accomplish. We want to have an assignment list, who, who's helping and who's doing what. We need to have a burn permit. Um, you get that from CAL FIRE. Uh, usually in the burn permit you have the day and the time, um, start and end times, uh, any agency contacts, um, and that you have to make sure that you get that and have that um, with the rest of your prescription. Usually we want either a map or maps depending on um, on what you need and how many people you got working and how big the area is. You need to have some sort of a contingency plan set up, uh, especially a medical plan if something were to go wrong with somebody working on the burn. You need to have um, the weather that that um, usually, um, it depends on where you're working, but some people like to have that day's forecast and the day before and the day after, you know, a three-day forecast. Some people like a seven-day forecast, a 10-day forecast, it really depends. Um, you also would, would like, um, if you can, if there's a, a weather station nearby to be able to be constantly um, checking the weather or having a uh, Kestrel, and we'll talk about that later system with you where you can just have um, a spot weather forecast right there um, in the area you're working. And then finally, um, there should be a go, no go checklist, which basically is a checklist of things that say, you know, I've got this, 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 this. And if you can check them all off, let's go burning. If there's something that doesn't work, then it's not the right day to burn. So what, what's going to, um, affect your burn prescription or what things do you really need to consider? as you make your burn prescription. So you need to really look look at the weather and really understand the weather and what uh for your area what is important. You know, are fire are are the fires in your area really wind driven? Um or are they are they um topographically driven? Um in terms of whether is it um do you need to be done by a certain time because um it, for instance, in the southeast, we know that most of the um, storms, the um, the thunderstorms happened in the afternoon. So if you weren't done by 2 p.m., you could really find yourself into trouble. So 
most of the time we were trying to light in the morning and be done by 1 p.m. so that we didn't have to worry about what happened after 2 p.m. when most of the thunderstorms usually tried to tried to roll into town. Um, and you really have to understand smoke and air quality, so be able to understand where your smoke is going, and not only where your smoke is going, but what is nearby. So, you know, do you have a town nearby? Um, do you have um, big, huge uh, roadways that could be affected? Um, we were burning at one property in Georgia, and uh, we were burning near um, near uh, I-95, which is a big uh, big north-south freeway going through multiple states um, so you know if we were to smoke out that area that would um, that could lead to some major problems uh, and it's really important um, when we're talking about um, if we're talking about burning in the Sierra Nevada is that we've got um, even though we have a lot of topography there that topography comes with valleys so it's you know you could easily smoke out the town or smoke out um, part of the valley if you uh, if you're doing a big enough burn so it's it's really important because uh we've seen with these big huge wildfires what happens to our air quality and how that how that affects us so it's really important to understand your smoke and where it's going to go and where it's going to sit and how long it's going to be there and that actually will tie into your weather if you're looking at the right factors for weather as well um and understanding things like mixing height and transport wind speed um your fuels so what kind of a fuel component are you talking about? You know, is it, is this forest or rangeland? You know, are these annuals or perennials if it's uh, rangeland? If it's forest, or do you have a mid-story, understory, mid-story, and overstory? You know, is it um, just big trees? Do you have a lot of down uh, material on the ground? Um, you know, what, what kind of fuels are we talking about? You know, is, are there things here that are going to burn and smolder for days? Or is this all, um, oh, it's just pine litter and smaller baseless layer. We're doing a nice, easy um, surface fire that, that'll burn out pretty quickly. Those are the things we want to, we want to know and have a good understanding of if we're going to, if we're going to burn in an area. We have to understand the human component. So um, not only the people who are working with us, but just the people who are in the surrounding community and um, and are going to be somehow affected by this fire. So um, are they, you know, are they people who live next door? You know, are we burning right next to their property? Are there people who are just going to drive by and go, oh my God, there's a smoke, there's a fire. I'm going to, you know, call the call the police um, you know we have to really understand the human component and be able to um, help with as much as we can with the human component and make sure that we've done our homework to, to make sure that the that we have we've you know um, made people as knowledgeable as we can to what we're doing other considerations you need to make um, what's the ignition pattern and what type of fire are you looking for so Understanding your weather, understanding where you want to um, have your smoke go, understanding uh, the fuels you're burning in will then help you figure out what what are you trying to do in terms of ignition or type of fire. Do I want a low um, low intensity uh, surface fire? Do I need to make it um, a little more intense because I'm trying to get rid of a mid story layer? You know, am I really trying to uh, burn up a lot of stuff? So I actually need to run a pretty hot fire through here, but I know because it's such a cold day and I'm surrounded by, you know, a uh, river on one side and an area covered in snow on the other that I can actually, if I can get this stuff to burn today, I can, I can rip it and really um, try and get rid of a bunch of fuel. You know, it's, it's those sorts of things that you have to kind of think about. Um, in terms of ignition pattern, there's, a few different ways to do it. Am I going to put little spots of fire down on the ground um, as I walk and then because I've got enough wind push or I just have enough continuous fuels that that will um, merge itself into a fire but help me control the speed of the fire or am I just going to um, because I've got road all the way around this thing I'm just going to light a ring around it and let it um, burn to the middle or um, in the case of a prescribed burn I did um, in the in the foothills in the East Bay of California, we just ringed a little hill and it just burned right to the top and then we were done. Um, it just depends on, on what you're trying to do. 
uh, knowing what season you're burning in. So um, that also will tie into the idea of um, what exactly are you trying to accomplish? Because um, if you burn in the in the fall versus the winter versus the spring versus the summer, um, you might you might get some different results in terms of what um, what resprouts or what comes back after after the prescribed burn has gone through. Certainly, if we're trying to restore the natural fire regime in California, that's much more um, tied with the idea of of um, summer burning or like um, uh, fall burning uh, because that's the normal time that we get that we get fires in California um, how does all this tie into your objectives and basically um, in saying that um, saying more the idea of what are you trying to accomplish by burning what is it where you're actually trying to to get done So how do you actually conduct a burn? So you want to figure out your ignition pattern um, for your prescribed fire. Um, you you want to you want to time it and space it correctly to control the rate of spread, intensity, and severity of the fire because all of those things are important. How fast the fire moves, um, how intense it is, especially in terms of the idea of how big of flame lengths do we have, and then the severity. Right? Um, we've talked about how severity can be um, extremely important in some areas, like if we have um, high litter loads uh, or litter and duff around trees, and if the if it if fire is allowed to just sit there for a long time and burn into the ground, it can burn into the roots and actually burn the tree from the inside out. So we got to be careful with um, with those ideas, but that ties into those things that we just talked about in terms of understanding your fuels and understanding your weather and understanding what you're doing in terms of your ignition pattern. Um, you also want to think about um, some suppression techniques that you might need um, to use in terms of um, doing a backfire um, or burnout. A backfire basically is lighting another fire that will draw in the main fire and eliminate um, eliminate the fuel because remember it comes down to fuel heat and oxygen we got to get rid of one of those things and if you're burning more than likely heat is not going to be the thing that we can uh, eliminate the easiest and we know oxygen is really hard to eliminate so we got to just find another way to eliminate fuel so we could light another fire going in the opposite direction that could eliminate the fuel um, and then a burnout same same kind of idea um, where we're trying to where we're trying to just uh, eliminate the fuel and um, finding a way to to um, to burn off um, burn off fuel so that the fuel's not not available to be burnt. So let's take a look at just kind of you know the basic um, idea of prescribed burn techniques. So there's three types of um, fires um, that you can use. I mean you can kind of get more creative with it, but the basics of it are, you know, there's a head fire, which means to go with the wind. There's a flanking fire, which you go, um, you have the wind basically off at your side. So let's say if we were burning this way, uh, flanking fire, the wind would be coming from this direction or this direction. So you'd get kind of half of the push you get from a head fire, but you get a little bit of that reverse push you get from a back fire. And then a backing fire, that's where you burn into the wind. That's what's happening right here. So how does that happen where you burn into the wind? Well, what you do is they started with this natural fire break here. And so what they did was they sent somebody along, this igniter here, and he goes along and he starts dropping fire. So he dropped um, he dropped a spot of fire here, dropped a spot of fire here, dropped a spot of fire here, and until he gets to the road. And what's happening is the wind pushing from this direction, pushes the fire and the fuel, because it's continuous, will merge up and eventually form one line. And then this fire will eliminate all this fuel back into this fire. And so now all this area will be burned and you send the igniter up here and he does it again. And then all that merges together and the wind pushes it back into the other fire. And that's how you would do a backfire. If we were doing a head fire, you'd be doing the same thing, but the wind would be coming from this other direction. So you'd put it, you'd ignite a head here, and then the, the fire would be burning towards you. Now, the hard part is, 
if you say to yourself, well, I don't want to be igniting in front of a fire, yeah. So you'd have to really understand your wind speed to know how far ahead you need to go so that there's plenty of time and plenty of fuel in between you and that fire if you're gonna if you're gonna be um, igniting uh, on a head fire. With a flanking fire, you just kind of have to um, you know it's not gonna move as fast as the head fire. It's not gonna move as slow as the backing fire. It's gonna be kind of halfway in between. So you really have to just judge that. Um, in terms of kind of um what are the jobs people are doing so these guys are watching um where we started here to make sure we're not getting a jump onto this other piece of land we've got another crew of people here watching to make sure that it's not going uh, past this area going this way that we don't want it to go past we have um, a water or a foam truck just in case things kind of get a little um too out of hand um and some of the other things that we want to have happen we want to start with a little bit of black line so more than likely we probably did a little bit of a test fire here to see how our fire was burning that day and make sure before we kind of send this guy up and just say hey go for it we want to just light small little test fires maybe black line a little bit here to really see how's our fire burning how does it burn into the wind how does it burn against the wind to really give us an idea of of what we're dealing with uh, the only thing I'd probably add to this picture myself is there should be somebody somewhere um, with a uh, with a kestrel, which is a little portable weather station, taking taking weather readings and and um, just keeping us um, up to date on the weather and making sure if it's changing or not. Especially uh, the idea of uh, wind direction, because if we say we're going to do a backing fire, but we're in, in an area where it notoriously um, you might get wind shifts, you know, at certain points of the day. It's really important to know. So we talked about the idea that air quality is important. So if we're talking about how do we do a prescribed burn, we definitely want to um, understand air quality. So if you pause the video here, you can um, click on our local Valley Air website, which is the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. And then you could also read this um, report and proposed actions that they put forth in 20 uh, in 2015. But the big thing um, with air quality is that because we sit in the valley and it's something we've discussed in class before, you know, you got mountains on both sides. So, it, you know, things, the air quality, everything kind of sits down because we're the lowest point and, and the air kind of, um, you know, sinks down. Um, into the Central Valley. So if if you have things like fires happening, we're going to get that. You know, it's the reason why we get the Thule fog sitting um, sitting in this area all the time. It's that's just the way the Central Valley works to topographically. You know, we're the lowest point, and the heavy air is always going to work its way towards the lowest point. And so if we put a lot of particles into the air, like we would with a uh, with fire. And that's going to affect air quality. So it's just something to keep an eye on and something to um, keep in mind and always be aware of. And, you know, if you're going to be somebody who burns a lot or really wants to do prescribed burning, you have to understand the air quality, um, understand air quality and really understand what what they are looking for and, and how you can help them and how they can help you because it's got to be a good relationship if you want to, to really get stuff, really get things done. So what kind of equipment do we need? So the first thing we're going to start off with is personal, prote personal protective equipment or PPE. And that's the safety gear issued um, to help uh, protect firefighters uh, when it's properly uh, used and maintained. So the big deal in my mind is uh, properly used and maintained because um, the safety gear is it's good, but it's only good if you um, if it's done correctly and and used correctly. Now. Um, because we're talking about prescribed burning and we're not talking specifically about wildland fire. Um, there'll be slight differences. Um, you still, if you can, if it's available to you, you want flame resistant clothing. So there's, um, there's a brand, uh, a brand called Nomex where, um, that's aramid fiber clothing. It's 
flame resistant. It's not fireproof. You're not going to go walking through fire. However, it is it is flame resistant. Um, and they, they make um, shirts and pants. I think they even make um, like beanies and, and fleece jackets out of Nomex. So there's all sorts of flame resistant clothing um, available. It's expensive. Um, but, you know, if this is something that you're going to do quite a bit of, it'd be a good investment. But there's other ways uh, that we can we can um, look at PPE but you do want um, as much as you can flame resistant um, pants and shirts uh, you if um, you want uh, cotton and not really polyester materials um, for pants um, jeans uh, usually work pretty well if you can't get a hold of some some Nomex pants um, shirts you want long sleeves because um, we're not trying to get singed on our forearms or, or any other places um, it's probably a good idea to keep your your church your shirt tucked in I know for some people that's not um, maybe the you know their favorite thing to do but that's um, it's just kind of important because um, the idea of, of loose clothing can get caught on snags or um, you know branches things like that and we don't want anything to kind of um, create a problem um, for us. Uh, another thing is you don't want to paint names or decals on on flame resistant clothing because it, it'll just uh, ruin the, the flame resistant uh, nature of the clothing. So here's a couple examples. So this is our typical wildland firefighter uh, gear down below. You got helmet, you got Nomex shirt, Nomex pants, uh, backpack, um, all those sorts of things to me this is your more up above here is your more traditional um, prescribed burning outfit leather gloves long pants long sleeve shirt um, some sort of eye protection and then um, we can't see the feet on either of these people but um, but boots usually usually leather boots um, if it's firefighting it has to be eight inch high leather boots if we're um, out doing prescribed burn I would just say um, leather boots would would be just fine any kind of leather boots high tops are probably um, a little bit better than a, than a low top would be because uh, just that much more ankle protection and um, and keeping fire um, out of uh, away from your legs because you know you're with prescribed fire we're going to be putting fire on the ground so there's going to be fire right next to us on the ground so I do want a little more of a higher boot uh, myself but I would say the at a minimum we want long pants long sleeve shirt leather gloves eye protection and boots in terms of our equipment um, the two main things that um, that you'll probably see are the drip torch here on the left and a backpack pump or some version of a backpack pump um, here on the right uh, in terms of water, uh, the the burns that I've been on, the most common form of water is just going to be a backpack pump. However, you can have um, just a um, a pump with a hose on it in the back of a truck. Uh, you might have um, some sort of setup like this with an ATV that you could hook up to um, a trailer with a water pump. You might actually just have a um, a water tender or or a fire engine uh, available. I've been on um, some burns where um, a Cal Fire engine is not necessarily right on site, but it's within um, within the area, so that we could just call them and they could and they could show up. In terms of your drip torch, um, this is the drip torch here on the right. So here's the different um, parts of the drip torch. You've got the handle here, you've got the um, the tank, you've got the the locking ring, you've got the spout, you've got your nozzle and igniter, and then the the wick. So there's your nozzle, here's your wick, and the way you want to have this set up is that you have your handle here, so that's where you're going to be holding it. So you want the um, the wick to be away from the handle and the nozzle to be in line with the handle, so that way when you are holding it, you can uh, turn it, and the nozzle will drop the tank mix onto the wick, which is how we're going to get our fire, as you can see right here. So the wick is going to hold the fire and then we're going to drop the um, the uh, fuel onto onto the wick, and that's how we're going to get fire onto the ground, as you can see in the background there. Now there is um, a few different links 
that you can click on here for the drip torch and so just go ahead and pause and check out all those links so in terms of other equipment that you might see um, this is also wildland firefighting um, equipment so um, you may see some of this stuff you may not see any of the these things McLeods, fire rakes fire swatters um, in firefighting in the southeast we definitely had a few swatters around that's our way to um, reduce or get rid of oxygen because we say you know fuel's the easiest thing for us to get rid of in terms of fuel heat and oxygen a fire swatter there um, allows you to kind of smother out um, parts of the fire and actually works well in terms of as a prescribed fire tool uh, another um, kind of um, maybe not so well known um, prescribed fire tool is the leaf blower uh, if you're in an area that lacks topography or you're in an area that uh, lacks um, wind or consistent wind, a leaf blower can um, be used to, to give you that um, consistent wind or give your fire a little push uh, in the right direction. So you can um, click on this video here to watch a uh, leaf blower in action. In terms of weather, um, used to be a big thing. Um, belt weather kit and you had to you had to um, know how to use a sling psychometer and uh, read the tables and write down your observation sheet now we have these digital weather meters like a kestrel so you can pause and um, take a look at the video uh, linked here but this is a kestrel right here and if you get um, if you get a um, we have just a like a couple steps above the basic uh, model but it can tell us wind speed, wind, um, wind speed, um, temperature, uh, relative humidity, um, just, you know, kind of the basics that, that we would need to know, um, and need to keep an eye on, uh, in terms of, uh, of, um, shifting. Uh, some of them even tell you, uh, dew point and, and other measurements that could, um, really be helpful if you're you know if you're in a check your fuel or something that's harder to understand so let's talk about um just a case study just a burn that i did in november of 2019 in shaver lake it was in sierra nevada mixed conifer and it was on southern california edison lands and if you're not familiar with southern california and what they do in terms of conservation you can click on the link here and so these are the fuels. So your typical Southern uh, uh, Sierra Nevada mixed conifer, you can see not much of a continuous herbaceous layer below, but um, a, a kind of, you know, dent, not super dense um, forest, but definitely um, more trees per acre than there needs to be in this area. The overall objective of the burn was um, that they wanted to um, they want to continue to restore this area to a um, sugar pine forest right now it's mixed con uh, more mixed conifer than they want it to be and it's not that mixed conifer is a bad thing but the idea that um, some of these areas used to be more of a pure um, sugar pine forest and then there, there was that mixed in with areas of mixed conifer are okay but you can see you get a lot of these understory trees and you're you're connecting your fuels and you're setting yourself up for what could be a bad burn especially with the amount of beetle kill um, that exists in the Sierra Nevadas right now and it'd be better to just have an open uh, a more open sugar pine forest than it is to have all of these trees uh, right next to each other so here's another look and you can see back here how dense um, how dense it can get um, in the background right we can't even really see through there you can see you can see through here that's not too bad but then you get right here and you can't see through those trees so we've got we've got too many trees um, we got uh, we got a much denser forest than we need and so um, that was the goal so we lit a test fire um, we actually were on a, um, a little bit of a knob so we started at the top of the hill and we're going to backfire um, down down the hill um, basically so we started off burning a little bit in the understory here to see how much of a carry we were going to get and we weren't getting a ton of carry uh, if we had continuous fuels 
it was working out. If we didn't have continuous fuels, it was um, taking some effort. So some areas you're going to have to put a lot of fuel on the ground. Some areas, not so much. So this is John Mount here. He is a uh, Central uh, Sierra Nevada legend. Uh, in my mind, somebody who's been burning since the 1960s and um, really just understands forestry at at um, at a very um, practical level. So he started to ignite this area, and we can see we've got some tree torching here, and that's okay. We wanted to get rid of some of the uh, it, the goal was to get rid of some of the incense cedar and some of the um, some of the other trees. Uh, our big goal was Jeffrey pine or sugar pines some Jeffrey Pines, those sorts of things we wanted to keep around. The other trees, it's okay to get rid of them. And then, of course, trying to burn off. You can see um, some of the downed woody fuels here on the ground. We wanted to get rid of those as well. So we're getting some combustion in areas. You can see there's just some different pictures of it happening here. And now we're working our way um, down the hill. So you can see... Um, you know, not so bad in this area. We got it's opened up um, decently there. So really, we're just trying to burn off uh, the litter in the understory. Here, um, you can see there's some dense, some density back there. We're getting some tree torching back here, which, like we said, if we didn't burn the sugar pine, the, the tree torching's okay. And we're getting rid of the understory so far. And you can see here's our lighting technique. So you can see, um, you know, we had to, we couldn't just drop a spot here and then drop a spot there. We weren't getting enough, um, there wasn't enough fuel to to make that happen. So what we're doing is dropping lines of fuel. So this person right here with the torch, you can see John pointing to the right there and they're just walking along this line and trying to drop as much fuel as they can. And then that way you get a line like this through the forest and then, um, that's just going to push against the wind and hopefully eat up all this fuel the way it's happening uh, over there. So um, just kind of continue doing that. You can see another getting another tree torching off right there. Um, you can see, um, you know, we've got uh, the person with the torch right here. There's not really, you know, any worry about we haven't put ourselves um, anywhere near the fire to where you know, we'd have to worry about, you know, running away or getting out of the way of the fire. We, you know, we're lighting far enough ahead to where um, it's not much of a concern. And you can see with how I took these pictures that nobody's, you know, anywhere near the fire. Because some of these areas, you know, like if you were up here, got pretty hot at some points. Um, just another couple views as we start working our way down the hill. You know, a lot of these, um, a lot of this, the younger, smaller trees like to get rid of these pockets so that we can um, create more space for the for the pine overstory. And then um, you can see an area like this where you got these big down heavy fuels on the ground. I was on the on the torch at this time, and I was told to you know get rid of as much of this as I could. So, you know, I did my best to put um, a lot of fuel on the ground. Um, I met up with the other burner, so I'm, I came down this side of the hill, he came down this side of the hill, and then we kind of met at the bottom, and there was a lot more of the downed um, woody fuel at, at the as we got towards the bottom, so really had to put a lot of fire on the ground. So this was the result um, after putting... Um, quite a bit of fire on the ground, so you can see kind of the interior here burning off, um, burning off um, a lot of the. Now we got into some some um, Sierra Nevada chaparral mixed in with the the down woody fuel, and you can kind of just get an idea here on the left of how we kind of started off, got it burning up pretty good, and then you can see um, in terms of we talked about the idea of how hot does a fire burn? So was it burning pretty hot here? We got that white ash, you know, mixed with a little bit of black. So we got it burning pretty hot. And you kind of have to if you're going to really try and get rid of big, huge, down woody fuel like that. So this is uh, pictures I took from the bottom. Got rid of some of the uh, the trees, you know, the, um, the encroaching mixed conifer trees that we weren't kind of interested in, plus getting rid of 
um, some of the chaparral, which it's not necessarily that we wanted to get rid of the chaparral, but remember chaparral um, doesn't mind fire, especially um, big, uh, big uh, uh, crown fire. So it worked really well um, for the chaparral. I expect that chaparral to fully grow back, but you can see the white in here um, from really, I got a pretty ripping fire through this bottom part because we were trying to get rid of all that down woody fuel at the bottom. Uh, just here now, I'm all the way down. Um, the hill is up this direction, and um, you can see um, we've we've uh, cleared out some decent patches. We do have a pretty good size smoke going, but it was um, going up into the canopy, so that or sorry, up above the canopy, so that uh, works out really well. And you can see like this um, chaparral right here. On the corner of the road you'll need to burn that so i'm off at a safe distance letting this thing burn enjoying the nice view because i've made it down the hill and this is a picture of our um, smoke column you can see we're getting decent lift not great lift because it's not going like straight up and and into the atmosphere it's, it's getting pushed a little bit in one direction but but not too bad. We're not smoking out the area down here. You can see people aren't covering up or anything like that, so that's good. And then this is how many people were involved. If you say, wow, you need this many people to burn. This was also a training exercise for a lot of people. I just tagged along because I knew what I was doing and I knew I'd get the chance to uh, get on the torch, so I jumped in. Um, but you can see we got a um, water a water truck here, an engine if we need it, and um, we had some tools that um, for the most part just ended up being helmet holders because they weren't really necessary because there was um, lines put in around this um, around this hill that really made it easy to control the fire. Just another look at the smoke column. And then I've got a few video clips. And so you can see um, this was that, that part I was telling you about where the down woody fuels were quite a bit. So had to get it burning um, pretty well. There's the comparison to the other side where you can see just, you know, more much more low intensity fire. But here really had to cook the fuels. And in having to cook the fuels, that means you're going to cook a, a tree or two, but that's that's okay. So still the same fire burning up. Um, you can see we're doing a little thermal pruning on this tree right here. That's also not, not a bad idea. Once again, the comparison to the uh, other side over there. Um, and really just trying to show you that, that white on the, um, on the, uh, the, the white ash being created because it's, it's a pretty hot fire. And just uh, now a little bit farther down the hill, so you can see the uh, chaparral in the understory. And you can see um, over here we got a cedar tree here. You know, if I could have burned a couple of those trees, they would have been fine with that too. But I'm more focused on the area back here. One of these trees, either one of them or both of them, ended up torching out um, eventually at some point in time. But, you know, focus was on really trying to maintain the pine overstory. So as long as you knew how to identify the pines from the cedars, you were all right. Okay, same thing, another look at it. Um, really got, you can see the area back there was where I was working before. You can see the amount of smoke that we're putting up in the air. I'm just trying to give you an overall idea of what it looks like to be on a prescribed bird up in the Sierra Nevada. So um, that's, um, you know, the basics of prescribed burning. And um, I could go into <laughs> way more detail if I really wanted to, but, um, you know, trying to keep it to about an hour lecture. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, if you have any questions, just contact me.